Welcome and thank you for tuning in to Jazz Education in the Era of Black Lives Matter. This is part two of a three panel series, Jazz in the Era of Black Lives Matter, curated by myself and Naomi Extra. You can learn more about these panels to come in the, at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem's website. So for today's interview, we welcome a steam flute player, American experimental music artist, composer, educator, visionary, and leader of many conceptual ensembles, former president of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, AACM, and the new director of the Jazz Studies in the, uni in, in the University of Pittsburgh D Dietrich School. Please welcome Nicole Mitchell. Hey, how's it going? Doing all right. I'm doing all right. And I'm Thanks glad- Thanks for having me. I'm glad you're here. In the interest of time, I'm, that's as far as I'm gonna go, as far as your, your accomplishments and, and what you've been doing and what you're up to. I want everybody on here to just go online and just just snoop around, go to Nicole's Bandcamp page, go to her website. Music is absolutely amazing. We're going to dive into jazz and education in the era of Black Lives Matter. Um, but I want everybody to know um, that if you want, if if you got, if you have thoughts or questions or comments, feel free to tweet us. But use the hashtag Jazz in the era of BLM. Now, before we get to diving deep into questions with Nicole, I just want to let everybody know again where this concept comes from. Um, jazz in the era, Black Lives Matter. Uh, the the idea of this series came out of uh, conversations that me and my wife Naomi extra we had and we began having back in 2012 after Trayvon Martin was killed. And then again in 2014 when Mike Brown was murdered by the police and left on the street. And we paid attention to some of the organizing that was emerging in places like Florida, Chicago, and New York. And we began uh, to talk about how to connect conversations uh, about social justice to some of these concepts that inform the Black Lives Matter movement. And we found that too often conversations around jazz and social justice just completely ignored or disengaged themselves from uh, Black Lives Matter so and movement for Black Lives. So for today's panel, we, we really want to explore some of the most pressing issues in jazz education uh, within the context of the movement for Black Lives. So without further ado, Nicole Mitchell is here. I'm so glad you are here. I just want to, I want to begin with asking you a question. Um, can you, could you briefly just talk about how you were educated um, as a, as a, as a jazz artist and, um, and what were some of the richest and most problematic aspects of your education coming up? Thank you so much, Jerome. I was roller skating around playing Mozart at UC San Diego when Jimmy Cheatham, who is a member of Count Basie's band and you know the jazz teacher at UC San Diego tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, I think you should take the jazz improv class. <laughs> that was actually the beginning of me improvising. So I had already gotten into the flute. I fell in love with the flute in fourth grade, but I actually didn't get a chance to have the instrument in my hands until I was almost in high school. And then once I got the instrument, that instrument is not something that's very highly celebrated in jazz music. So even though I heard re jazz records at home, you know, and I was listening to the music and it was around me, no one ever said, well, you should play jazz. And that never, that conversation didn't happen until I went to college. So when I actually found out, when I actually stepped into the room in an improv class with Jimmy Cheatham, I was kind of angry <laughs> that oh. it was like, how could people have left this out, this conversation with me out the all this time that I've been playing music the whole time I was in high school and I was in orchestra, I was in wind ensemble, I was writing arrangements of, of, of music for my friends that played flute. <laughs> But the idea of improv is improvisation was not just automatically handed on a plate to me 
And so I actually rebelled from classical music when that happened and I started playing on the street right away. Like literally right away, I started playing on the street. And in playing on the street, I wanted to animate people like to illustrate them through music as I saw people walk by. And so that's how I started approaching improvisation along with, you know, studying with Jimmy Cheatham. And he sent me to the music library to hear Eric Dolphy and to hear Hubert Laws and, you know, to hear John Coltrane. And I fell hard in love with Ornette Coleman from the beginning. <laughs> you know, and James Moody, and he brought, Jimmy Cheatham brought James Newton to class one day. And James Newton is a really tall, towering figure. He comes in and he's a flute player and he takes his flute out and he plays Amazing Grace like I've never heard in my life. Like it just went through me and reorganize my molecules and everything. Like it was just like the truth, <laughs> the truth entered, you know, my whole consciousness of what this music could be at that moment. And it horrified me because I was like, how, what else is there to do? You know what I mean? He's, yeah. he's the answer, you know what I'm saying? And that was really it for me. Um, a little bit later, you know, I would, uh, well, or during this time as well, because this is still before I was 21, I would go to Chicago. I was going to Chicago every summer and every Christmas to see my grandparents and spend time with them on the South Side. And one, one of these times I had a little boyfriend <laughs> and we snuck into this lounge, you know, we're underage, we snuck into this lounge and he had this idea, like we were gonna go to this place and we got in, they let us in. They didn't cart us. It was on 75th street in Chicago. And it was the new apartment lounge with Von Freeman playing. And when I heard that, I was like, this is it. I wanna be a jazz musician. That was really it for me when I heard Von Freeman. And to see him so freely sharing with the audience, and, and bringing up musicians to play. And they played all night till, I didn't get to stay till four in the morning, but I found out later, <laughs> coming back when I was a little older that those jam sessions would go till 4 a.m., you know? So that's really how I got started. And so when I got turned on, the first thing I did was like, I had to get out of here. I, I, I wanted to leave California. I, I went to, um, I went to school in California from like third grade till like my first two years in college. And when I finished high school, I wanted to leave California, but my dad wouldn't let me, but I had a really negative experience. Um, you have to look at the time period was the beginning of integration in the seventies. And here comes this black family to an all white neighborhood. And we were not welcome at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm dealing with fights and getting kicked out of school and and people spitting on my face, literally spitting on me. And this was a real hardship. Um, but I feel like when I talk about the jazz music, it was something these experiences and made Chicago stand out to be this kind of utopia and a mecca for just being yourself as a black person. There's so much diversity and blackness that you can just be yourself. And there's also a great tradition of creativity in Chicago. So I have to add that to my jazz education because when I was, uh, I left San Diego and then I went to Oberlin. And when I went to Oberlin, Donald Byrd was teaching there. And so he was really one of my primary jazz teachers. He was amazing. Like we would, me and a few other students would be with him until like one in the morning in the conservatory. And like, he just had endless passion in sharing with us. And he told me about, you know, how he helped Bobby Humphrey get started and, and um, 
Herbie Hancock at Howard and and he was like, yeah, you as good as Bobby Humber. You know, you just start now, but you'll get it. And, he, you know, he was really good. And that that was a really beautiful start in terms of in the education, the academia and jazz. But unfortunately, that didn't last. <laughs> so I had some negative experiences after that. Um, when I went back to Oberlin, um, Donald Burr was just filling in. Um, for Wendell Logan, who was on sabbatical. But Wendell Logan had hired some other people that were very unreceptive to me as a woman, the only woman in the jazz program in the first year of the jazz program in the conservatory mm -hmm. at Oberlin. And also a flute player. Who cares about the damn flute? So that was a problem. I was a problem. And... I was actually miserable being told every week, you're never gonna make it playing jazz flute. You need to pick up the saxophone. So I dropped out and moved to Chicago. And so the rest of my jazz education was really <laughs> in the streets, you know? You have to add a, a few, I was definitely a soul searcher as a young person in my 20s. So you have to add some, some little, adventures back in California studying with James Newton and running you know running around and going to spend nine months in New Orleans over here and then <laughs> you know but for the most part Chicago was the home base and uh yeah yeah you got playing on the street was very central to meeting a lot of great musicians and connecting and learning from them <laughs> sorry for that long story no that's great that's great and and I'm I want in, everybody out here to know that if they want more information on, on, on this, uh, shout out to George Lewis, his book, uh, um, A Power Stronger Than Itself, uh, American Experimental Music. Um, your, that profile that you just laid out, he wrote beautifully in his book. And mm -hmm. I think everybody, everybody has that journey. You know, they have their journey and, and education can turn you on and inspire and, or, and it can also turn you off. <laughs> you know, yeah. if it's done, if it's done in, in a, in a way that's not very sensitive, in an insensitive way. Um, but you mentioned Chicago and Chicago is deep. I, I get excited when I think about Chicago and I'm, I want to go to this next question. Barbara Ransby, she wrote a book entitled, uh, well, making all black lives matter. And it talks specifically about black feminism being the bedrock for black lives matter, the black lives matter movement. And one of the key concepts that comes out of black feminism that she talks about is, is intersectionality. So yes. do you, do you think that the black lives matter movement has, or is shaping the way, uh, how we think about jazz education? And if so, uh, how, and if, and if, and if how, or if, if, if it's not, do you think it's not like, what is, what is your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's one of the most inspiring things to me about the black lives matter movement is that it's led by black feminists, a lot of the leadership. And, and within that, there is a whole consciousness that's opened up in terms of just, <clears throat> you look at the black power movement in the sixties and like we ask ourselves what went wrong or how did we get kind of stuck after that? And I feel that what happened with Black Lives Matter took us to that next place where like you say, Black feminism is plays a central role. It's always played a central role in all of our years and of movement towards liberation in this country. It's always played a role, but I think now it's more uh, embraced, I would say. It's more embraced community-wide, like across the spectrum. And women's voices and also like non-conforming voices in general like more you know like unique voices are being more centralized and more embraced and for me like Chicago has a lot of strong leadership of you know you look at like the Black Panther Party was really strong in Chicago 
And actually, when we look at Breonna Taylor, that's the first thing I think of. I don't, and I know I'm getting a little off topic, but the way she was killed was the same way Fred Hampton was killed. Right. You know, and we never got over Fred Hampton's death. And the silence around Breonna Taylor and the and the justice that hasn't like we don't have this global movement for justice for Breonna Taylor like we had with George Floyd. That's very problematic. And I see that as related to her being a black woman, which shows that we still have a long way to go. So even though we I think have more of an embrace of of um and sorry, my my words are a little I'm a little too excited, but uh <laughs> We have more of an embrace and we have an empowerment of Black women, but yet there's still limitations that we're facing and they're being really evident in that in her case with Breonna Taylor in terms of the world not just under, like having complete motion behind moving this forward, which is very frustrating. I mean, we're in, we're in a period that I think more than any other time, this idea of hope is a real question mark. Because the idea of progress is a real question mark where even with the assassinations of King and Malcolm X, there was still this idea that, well, okay, those were assassinators. We can still move this agenda forward. But right now, we really have, a lot of soul searching to do. And I really don't think us as Black people want to go anywhere. This is our land and we have put too much into it, but how do we move this forward? I think these are questions that, it, going back to jazz, have been addressed in the music. They've not only been addressed musically, like, you know, looking at um, how a lot of really amazing artists have used some of these ideas and concepts as themes for their music, but also with organization, music organizations. I feel that the ACM came out of these types of conversations, you know, and the idea for agency and self-determination as a way of, of not only liberating the musicians, but bringing forth consciousness to the community and, and supporting the community. You look at the Pan-African People's Orchestra in LA doing the same thing, that that music funded a lot of the movement too, you know? So yeah, that's a lot. No, 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 that, that, I think what you're saying is very timely. Um, what, you know, talking about the AACM, I, I think it's so important that that model of having a kind of an all encompassing uh, organization that deals with uh, education, that deals with so uh, you know expression. Th there was a school, you know. Um, I I feel as though um, like a, a a a lot of a lot of most of the education happens like beyond the walls of the university, right? Mm -hmm. And like. Speak on like how is why is that important? Like why is it important to get not they're not some students feel like they can get everything solely under the under under that that uh that comfort zone of being in those walls. But what happens when you leave and 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 why is that important to 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 be a part of the community? A lot of jazz programs have focused for so many years. I mean, a lot of these jazz programs are coming up to their 50 year mark or their 40 year mark right now. And a lot of them have focused on skills, you know, musical skills. Can you play the language? Can you, do you know the history intellectually? Do, you know, can you play music of these different periods and these different styles, you know, and do you have that? you know, do you have that down? But then when it comes to actually connecting the music to African-American culture, to African-American people, 
that part has gotten left behind too much. That people have to take more classes in music theory and Western European classical music theory than they have to take in black studies. And we've seen the outcome of that, I think. We've seen the outcome of that. And that shows that moving forward right now, this is, I mean, I think the Black Lives Matter movement makes it clear how important it is that students not only take these classes where they learn, like you talked about intersectionality, learn about their position of power and how they can contribute and, and how they have to be open to receive others that are not walking in their shoes, but also have some connection to realize that this music is about community and it's about you knowing where it comes from and, and being respectful to that legacy. Like for example, like if I have a band playing and one of the musicians wears like a dirty t-shirt and, and like some dirty dusty boots or something, I'm like, what, what are you doing? You're not respecting the music. Like you're not expressing like your understanding of where this music comes from. That's just a little tiny example, but what I'm trying to do at Pitt, like I literally have just finished my first year. Like I'm just starting my second year, but what's important to me, what I'm trying to do right now is I'm working with the Center for African-American Poetry and Poetics at the university. And together we're collaborating to, to build a space in collaboration with the Hill District community, which is the historical district where jazz music comes from. It's an African-American community where you had all the greats coming through from Chicago and from New York to perform in Pittsburgh. And there were a lot of great musicians from Pittsburgh, like Billy Strayhorn, for example, and Mary Lou Williams. And so Mary Lou Williams is actually from um, Georgia. No, she's from Pittsburgh, but I was trying to think of the, the neighborhood she's from. She's not from the Hill District, but she is from Pittsburgh. And or she spent a lot of her life in Pittsburgh. And she started the Pittsburgh Jazz Festival. She started it. So we're trying to create a space, a collaborative space for the community and for the jazz program and the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics, where we have a meeting place where we can have a community jazz band, where we can have local musicians perform and have a listening room where people are coming to listen to the music like John Zorn Stone or like Fred Anderson's Velvet Lounge or like Billy Higgins World Stage, you know, a place like that where people can come and have regular concerts so that they can develop the music so that they can innovate and also, you know, continue the great tradition, you know, because we don't have enough small spaces in Pittsburgh that the musicians can play for audiences that really just want to come hear the music. There's restaurants, there's bars, you know, where you got to play quiet or you got to play this kind of stuff or that kind of stuff. So I'm excited about that because that means the students will have work to do in the community They'll learn a lot of different things. They'll learn about curation. They'll learn about uh, volunteering. They'll learn um, how, to, how to interact with a lot of different people from different walks of life. Because I think that's a real loss. This whole idea, the whole idea of the talented tenth is problematic, like Du Bois' talented tenth, oh, yeah. where everyone has something to offer and the university experience or the academic experience gets to be kind of uh, lofty, I would say, sometimes, where it's not really connecting with people's real experiences. And they, that's where the disconnect is happening with jazz. You got jazz has this big thing in academia, all these people coming out with these degrees. And then you still have people that come up that just learn in the community and there's like a disconnect, you know? So this, hopefully this place 
this meeting place, which right now I'm calling Jazz Lab, can help to have the students navigate, you know, and to be able to be contributing and be useful to the community. And we also, I'm starting a Jazz Community Council to advise the program. So these are elders in the community in Pittsburgh that will help to advise the program and what the com jazz community really needs and how we can support that. And also for them to give input on the different things we're trying to do. You so, know, yeah. Yeah, I think that's amazing. And those students at, at the University of Pitt, they need to, they are blessed. And I'm gonna tell you, you spoke to some, you said school is a bit too lofty these days. And you know what? <laughs> you know, you're right. And, and what that does, it, ca it causes a certain inequity. Elitism. It, elitism. All, elitism. It, then it, turns, it can turn into tokenism and all other kind of ism. But I feel like <laughs> we see all these inequities and, 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 and this widens for students. What are some of the ways that you, that you can think of to keep students engaged, especially students from marginalized communities? Because it seems like when you talk about loftiness, it's not the schools they're not designed for those who are coming from these marginalized communities mm -hmm. to, to participate. You're right. And unfortunately, the schools that I've been teaching in are research one institutions. I shouldn't say that's unfortunate. I mean, it's a blessing and there's definitely positive things about having someone like me in those, like, as a professor in that type of institution. But there's definitely issues of, of a lack of diversity, especially lack of, of representation of African-Americans. And I say African-Americans, I also will say Black because of the African diaspora. Um, but, you know, I think those are two things that we need to be aware of both of, of those. Um, and also lack of Latinx uh, populations on these on these campuses. One thing that I know that programs are starting to finally reconsider is that this whole testing thing. Um, but another thing, just looking at music in general, I've seen over the years how the different schools that I've been a part of, how they audition jazz students and how too many times a student will come in and they can sight read and cannot improvise and another student will come in who can improvise and can't read and they'll choose the student who can read and say oh you can learn how to improvise but they feel it's easier to teach someone to improvise than it is to teach someone how to read music mm -hmm. I think that has to change. That's a really big factor in terms of of um, marginalized students coming in that are self-taught, that may have a lot of really great experience to offer that everyone in the whole student community will benefit from, but maybe they're self-taught, you know what I mean? Maybe they're really gifted and they play by ear. Should that person be left out? You know what I'm saying? So. That's that's definitely a challenge. The biggest challenge, I think, is that the truth is that no one is guaranteed making money playing this music. That's the absolute truth. And so for someone to come into a program and say, I want a degree in jazz, you know, and I want to perform, I want to write music, I want to write about the music, you're taking you're you're taking a chance you have to be a certain type of person that's courageous and and this is what you are feel is the universe has given you as your purpose you know in a lot of a lot of ways and i think that also makes it difficult you know because in reality there's other other fields that people can go in and they can get a job and with our economy and with the challenges of of that those things are bigger systemic problems you know that make it really difficult um for 
actually for anyone coming into the music. But yeah. I think the rig the biggest problem is that a lot of the public schools don't have the music anymore. You know, because back in the day, you could finish high school and go straight on to a career. And you had learned a lot musically in your elementary and high school. And now that's just not the case for a lot of black and brown communities. You know, uh, that's just not the case. Because mm. of of this whole tax thing, like, you know, tax income, you know, these schools get the arts funding and these schools don't. And it's completely wrong and completely racist. Yeah. But how do we change those things? That's really where it starts. How many black schools have a music program with jazz in elementary school and high school and you know, like say in the major cities, like in Chicago, there is only like a very few number of black high schools that have music and the majority of all, all the white schools do. And that's where it gets set up to the college situation. You know what I mean? Well, we just didn't have enough applicants, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we're talking about, you're talking about inequities that's, goes far beyond just money. I mean, and, and inequity is, it, it's far more reaching than, 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 than money. I mean, you're talking about what, 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 what's the requirement to get in here? What, what, what are we putting weight on as opposed to what, what you know, what, what's, what are we prioritizing? How are we prioritizing who comes, who gets in, into the school? Right. Um, but you spoke to something bigger. You're talking about something that's systematic and we're talking about racial injustices. Um, and I want to I, I want to talk about um, re, like these injustices that are particularly tied to uh, music business practices. Now I know that um, Pitt, you, you you mentioned some fantastic musicians, and, and another one is Errol Garner, who yes, who, who, and we have his archives, his archives, and I, you know, there's there's a label situation between him and Columbia um, that I, I would like for you to speak on, but I'd also like for you to tie into what, why is it important for students to learn whatever, what lessons we can learn from this business inequities that has been happening historically to our musicians, to, to, to uh, jazz musicians, um, uh, a high volume being black jazz musicians and experimental uh, musicians that is hitting home right now at, at, at Pitt with these with these new archival papers that that that, that you all have of, of Mr. Gardner. I definitely can't encourage people enough to realize how amazingly. Uh, impactful it can be to dig into the literal history in archives in general, you know, to be able to see somebody's letters that they wrote, um, legal, uh, legal battles, contracts, these types of things. And Earl Garner was a real trailblazer as an independent musician who was successful in standing up for his his rights for his royalties for ownership of his music, which are still issues that musicians are dealing with today, like serious, like serious, serious. And and he was successful in in having ownership uh, through working with his lawyer, his agent, and we have those papers at Pitt. These papers can be useful for. Black studies, they can be useful for jazz, they can be useful for um, the idea of like um, history and, and also business, like Black business and just looking at like how certain approaches have been successful in the past with these big labels. 
and you know, for individuals to figure out how to navigate now. And so, yeah, Earl Gardner is a real great testimony and to have the evidence of that journey that he took is, is really special and really rare. And the jazz business right now, I mean, what, you know, not too long ago, I started asking myself, who is my publicist? What labels am I working with? Who's writing about the music that I make? Who are the people that hire me for different performances? What are the venues? Who owns these venues? <laughs> what are these festivals? And all of these questions that when we're in the bubble, we're just thinking about, oh, this is a great opportunity. Oh, like I'll have more, you know, exposure for my work and be able to share my work with more people. Oh, these are good people. These are nice people that are treating me well. You're just thinking about those things. But then when you really look at it through like a lens of racial justice, that becomes very problematic. You know, when I realized like, okay, I was putting out my own records and then I said, okay, let me try working with this independent label and this independent label and that independent label. And they're all owned by white people. And when I look to find black label owners, I find some in hip hop. I don't really see too many in jazz. And I have so many friends coming to me Nikki, what do I do? Where do I go? I have this project I want to put out. I don't really want to ask these people that I don't know and be rejected. And what do I do? And, you know, even with all of this online stuff that really gives us agency to be independent, there's still a very old machine that's working very well. And how do we, how do we expand that? How do we make an alternative? structure that is more not only more resilient but more representative more diverse and can these people this is what i'm asking is those people that have these positions going back to intersectionality those people that have these positions are they willing are they if they're gatekeepers are they willing to collaborate so that you know some other people from other backgrounds can get into these power positions and like have this experience. Like if you're a curator for a festival, can you have someone to co-create co -curate with you? Can you have a black woman co-create with you? Cause how many black women curators do we have? You know what I mean? Um, or if you have a band it's not just hiring the musicians, but like, can you create opportunities, you know, for your musicians to do more of their own projects? These are questions I'm, I've been asking myself because I think I can definitely do more. And then of course, being in leadership at Pitt, this idea with that I was talking about with the Jazz Lab, um, the community engagement, I'm excited about that. But I'm also excited about the opportunities to, uh, make adjustments to the curriculum. It'll be my first opportunity to do that. So I'm really excited about that too. I talk too much. Uh, nah, nah, no, you don't. Nah, let it because 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 you're speaking truth, and I I think when we talk about our heroes, and when we when we teach our heroes, we need to teach them. In my in my humble opinion, from uh a 360 degree turn. Mm -hmm. I think we need to talk about did they own their music? Mm -hmm. Who owns their music if they did not? Right. What kind of deals were they were they off was was offered to them and who were the people who sometimes those people who actually signed them we 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 hold up as heroes and if we really found out and taught our students I I I always want my students to to think more and not 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 necessarily just in a one one 
dimensional way of thinking, but if we constantly are putting, like, Errol, Errol Gardner is one of the greatest, if not greatest, piano players, right? To come, yes. to come through this music. Bar but none. Bar none. He's not on the cover of, of, of things, and he's not one of the, one of, he's not tokenized in the same kind of way. Ask yourself why. Maybe he doesn't own, maybe his publishing goes to someone in his family and not those who are purveyors of this, of this right. constant right. wave of good point synergizing those who are making money, who have nothing to do with putting the artistic uh, energy into the music, you know? So yeah. like you, 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 you're doing nothing but speaking truth, but we also talking about our ancestors and, I, I know you brought a piece. Yes, uh, yes. Could you could you speak to this piece before we get to the clip? I I I want to hear more about this. Piece. Okay, uh, <laughs> I'll try to be brief. This project um is one of my favorite projects ever because I always dreamed, I always loved the music of in Mali, and I always dreamed that maybe one day I could play with some musicians in Mali. But I'm like, but I'm you know I'm a woman like. They don't even have women playing these instruments. How are they going to work with me? You know, all this kind of stuff. But one day, somebody actually asked me, would you like to do this? And I was like, what? Yes. And so I had um, an amazing opportunity to do a collaboration with some of my musicians in Black Earth Ensemble and Balake Sissoko, who is this amazing core player. And he's very open. He's done a lot of collaborations internationally. And he brought some of his musician friends um, from Bamako. And we we in we were in France. We spent 10 days working together, them speaking Bambara, us speaking English, not too much French going on. <laughs> but musically, we worked it out. So the piece I'm playing is one of the pieces that I wrote uh, for the group. And I'm really excited that we we did this collaboration a few times and we made a recording. And I'm really hoping that in 2021, the first recording from this project will come out called the Bamako Chicago Sound System. Okay, so talking about the musicians for this project, you have Balake Sissoko, this amazing Cora master and he's really into collaborating with other artists he's worked with musicians all over the world so here was my opportunity to work with someone who's open-minded and actually even let me play some of my compositions where i'm not just learning there so we're trading off sometimes we're playing some of his music sometimes we're playing some of my music it was really amazing and we were trading off a language between bambara and english and neither, none of us were really that great with the French, but <laughs> we found ways to understand each other through the music. So my friend Manque Ndosi, uh, she's from Minneapolis and she is on vocals, but also Babani Kone is vocalist from Bamako. We had Felter Offered on guitar from Chicago, Josh Abrams on bass from Chicago, Jovia Armstrong on percussion from Chicago, all of them from Black Earth Ensemble. And we also had Fasari Diabete on the bottle of phone. So my ancestors trying to share this idea that as African Americans, we don't really know we have a lot of holes in our history. And we're, you know, it's a lot that we feel that we've lost. And this idea of trying to regain our knowledge and our connection with our ancestors is what the piece is about, which was a lot for them to embrace as griots who know everything about their history and is like what you don't know you don't know you don't know these things so it was it was a real a real experience a really great experience it was performed at Bronley Museum in 2014 in Paris <laughs> No. 
broken glass Concrete, concrete, concrete Looking for you talk about disparity and coming through this this you're talking about something that's very nuanced we're in black life we're in this era of black lives matter and people seem to be more open to listening and hearing uh the the the, the more in 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 intertwined and specifics and uh, like i said nuances of our our struggles um a big part of it is not knowing you know, not being able to connect with a body of land, a specific piece yes. of Yes, yeah. Uh, We're the only ones that don't have that. Absolutely, absolutely. In the whole world. That's right, that's right. In the whole world. We're the only ones that have no feeling of connect, like somewhere to go where you feel that you can be safe. Like right. there's nowhere to go. That's right. Like connect to... uh like like genealogy right we talk about could being connected to a body of land like you know and a lot of a lot of people have that but what's interesting about you in this 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 piece is you and your spirit has always been at least from what i can tell from checking out your music and and your journey from what you've been talking about today you have this uh uh you 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 interdisciplinary like you uh, or or you 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 have Ex external disciplines you, you're always collaborating right and you and you spend a bit of time with with poet and publisher a hockey uh my mm -hmm. and, and and you expressed that your time at third world press was was like super a, a super was a core to your uh, development now yes. could you speak to the importance of that cross-disciplinary interaction in, in, in education. Should that happen more? Definitely, definitely. And and then actually going back to this jazz lab, which is now a dream space because it doesn't exist yet, but I wanted to be able to have grid lighting and the right kind of flooring so that we could have dance, so that we could have, uh, you know, any type of interdisciplinary project where you have visual art, film, video, telematics, which is multi-locational performance, like with video, you know, like we're doing right now, except playing music uh, through high, through the high broadband university internet, which is like high resolution. Um, so interdisciplinary is really my most, my biggest love you know, of anything. And uh, I've actually been dabbling a little bit in video lately and it's really exciting. I don't hardly know what I'm doing, but I love it. I've been doing some electronics, which is new for me and just always trying to learn new things. And I love collaborating with musicians that challenge me and take me into new spaces that I have to navigate or writing for different musicians that may not read music, how to, like in this project, these musicians didn't read music. So I had to make everything and be able to teach it by ear. And they taught us everything by ear that we learned. So interdisciplinary is just a extension of collaboration, really. You know what I mean? And that just makes it more fun when you have a team, you know? And yeah, Haki Madhavuti and Third World Press are definitely like my foundation you know, um, he calls himself my cultural father. <laughs> and his wife married me and my husband. Really? 
Yeah, Safisha Matabuti, she married us. Wow. I mean, and you know, you, you, you talk about, you know, having a full understanding of the culture, right? Not just a specific music, not just this style, jazz or hip hop mm -hmm. or you you embody so much of the of, of of our music and our our story here can be told through music, right? And yeah. you embody that your that liberation narrative recording is absolutely it's it's crazy. It's it's amazing. Y'all check Thank you. Y'all check that out. Um, it's an education. Poetry is my favorite song on there. Well, but you're, you're a writer too. You know, you, you, you write. And this is something that, again, Pitt students, you are blessed right now because you have someone in uh, Nicole Mitchell that is, is going to push your, your imagination and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to break you out of your comfort zone and, and, and put you in situations, artistic situations that you might not have ever imagined or dreamed and 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 I feel like you're gonna stretch your students and I think I think they're really in for a treat, like for <laughs> for years to come, you know. Um any university you know, conservatory would be blessed to have you, I think, uh personally. Wow, thanks. Um and I, I, I gotta I wanna ask you another question here. Um Okay. We we spoke a lot today about, um, you know, uh, the, the inequities in the music, uh, your journey coming up, ways that we can um, incorporate an intersectional uh, thought in 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 our educational process coming through that um, that 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 communal black feminist style of, 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 of approaching, organizing, and, and, and I, I feel like we have to put out there what, we have to answer the question, what are some of the best practices that you think jazz educators who want to teach the music, right, that is socially engaged can turn to? What are some ways that they can do that? Because some people just go in with that, like you said, like you said earlier, with that technical thing. You got to be able to play giant steps through, you know, you got to be able to play Cherokee and, and, you know, like, how do you get it to be socially communal and socially engaged? How do you, what, what, what can these teachers and instructors turn to, to help them with that? Well, one thing is to create opportunities for students to play with community musicians. Like, for example, I'm a member of We Have Voice Collective, which is, you know, a group that focuses on uh, creating safer spaces, but and 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 creating a platform for people to be able to talk about, you know, issues of like boundaries that people need to have in order to not repeat some of these things that happen in our music and in other arts. Um, arenas like between relationships and power relationships it's not even about women specifically it's about when when someone's in a position of power and they abuse that power whatever that relationship is and let me get back to my point but but so I brought these musicians they're all musicians in this collective so here's all these women of different backgrounds culturally that come to the school to perform and I mix them up with some of the grad students and the grad students have to learn their music, rehearse and perform. And it's like all their charts are different. The way they communicate about the music is different in terms of what they want and things like that. So the students have to be quick on their feet and be humble and be like, oh, well, I don't understand. Why did you write it this way? And all that kind of thing. No, this is how they're presenting it to you. You have to be able to do your best in this situation. So I think more situations like that help students to kind of not have an ignorant uh, elitist attitude. Like I know music's supposed to be written this way and it's supposed to go like this. And you know, why you got all these parallel fists and all this kind of Western stuff that people get, you know, imbued with. 
<laughs> and then descend onto the community and learn like community people are like what are what are they talking about and they can't play you right. know so <laughs> you might end up with something really scribbly that you have to learn that you have to play it it's, it was scribbled out like in five minutes and you got to play it like these types of experiences i think keep the students more grounded in reality <laughs> you know what i'm saying that's just one example but yeah Man, I you Nicole, we 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 we're gonna we gonna head out. I, I I'm gonna ask one more question, okay? Okay. Um I, I just wanted to know like like your your music it, it mirrors uh like a political consciousness, plus you couple it with Afrofuturism. Yeah. Um do you uh, uh, will you approach what what your like that, that it's. I, I, I'm. I'm assuming it's the thought of a a, a utopian um, um, uh, um, existence for people. Is that? Am I? Am I? Am I? I'm. I'm not a. I'm not a hundred percent sure about what exactly Afrofuturism is. Okay, Afrofuturism is placing black people at the center of imaginings of the future. That's easy. Okay, so, <laughs> so we hear. So we can, so Ingrid LaFleur ran for mayor of Detroit on an Afrofuturist platform, which is totally amazing to me. Wow, wow, <laughs> wow. And, and so do you envision some of like your, uh, some of that in your approach to, to like, I mean, I know that's that's your your musical your music approaches your your music is is deeply invested in that. Um, I can hear it. <laughs> um, thanks for helping me to understand it. But, but will you will you be approaching teaching, educate? Ed I'm actually teaching a class in Afrofuture in this semester. Okay. But it's mostly non music majors. I mean, it's mostly just undergraduates, and it's just giving them concepts because. I feel that imagination is like the key to us co-creating a better reality. And people think imagination is for artists. Imagination is for like those loft lofty people over there. You know what I mean? But all of us have imagination. And when we watch movies and read stories, our imaginations are being employed by those artists towards whatever their vision is. But it's, it's really up to us to contribute to that. You know what I mean? And so musically, I do believe that I don't, well, first of all, I wouldn't try to get all students to do that because I don't think all students, that's how they're put together and how they make music. I make music based, narrative is very central to my music making, but it's not central to everyone. So I, I'm not, I, I really feel that for me, my job is to facilitate each student to have the most fluidity in expressing their voice. You know what I mean? And so it might not be Afrofuturism. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not going to like send out an army of Afrofuturists into the <laughs> world or anything like that. Uh, but for those that are interested, then of course, that's exciting for me to collaborate with them and work with them, you know, because my job is more to be a guide and to expose them to some ideas so that they don't get stuck in one thing you know but also and also to know like what all the possibilities are I love the concept of endless possibility you know and so I think I probably more teach based on that you know um, which is really core to the ACM mission which is People think ACM is all about experimentalism and playing weird stuff, but really it's about each individual being supported by the community to develop their own unique voice. You know, that's really what it's about. Wow. Well, <laughs> I, 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 have, I, I have to say, Nicole, it has been an amazing time talking, hearing you speak and your concept and what you're doing at Pitt. And I, I just, I mean, you, 
you brought up ACM. I, I know I gave uh, George Lewis a shout out. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I didn't, I, I got his book a little twisted. It's a power stronger. Stronger than itself. No. <laughs> They're stronger. Pick that book. And that concept, oh. I think for black people to embrace that, a power stronger than itself, like for us to realize that's what we are, that even in the midst of all this adversity, <laughs> Can't That's, stop us, black it, unstoppable. No, you, you, you can't. Um, it won't happen. And um, <laughs> I, I think I think that book is the I think that is one of the most definitive books on black American music and black American culture that you can and black creativity. Black creativity that you can find. But he touches on so much in that book. He touches on uh, some of the things we spoke about. He touches on writers how problematic writers can be. He touches, he touches on how problematic people coming into the culture from out of it that don't want to kind of uh, uh, humble thyself and listen. Um, those who want to monetize it, but don't have any other stake in the music other than monetizing it. So that, that I think that's an amazing book. I, I think, I think you are, have, you, you have created a environment that is that is hopefully going it's it's catching fire and historically your place is set in the, in our music and in our culture and I, I i applaud you for that ladies and gentlemen we are talking with uh american experimental music artist composer flute player educator visionary <laughs> Leader of many conceptual ensembles, please check her out. Check her music out. Check Nicole Mitchell out. She's here. She's speaking to us about uh, jazz education in the era of Black Lives Matter. We want to give a great big shout out to the National Jazz Museum in Harlem for sponsoring this conversation. Please, if you if you if if you want to tweet, if you want to uh, get get involved in this conversation, if you got a comment, please. Hashtag jazz in the era of BLM. So, Nicole, is there anything else you, you, you want to say before we head out of here? Could I just give a plug that we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the jazz program this November, the first week of November from the 2nd to the 7th. And we're celebrating Jerry Allen and Dr. Nathan Davis. Okay, okay. So big props. Thank you so much, Jerome. I really enjoyed our conversation. No problem. And I'm so glad you are there. Jerry is smiling and Dr. Davis is smiling as well. <laughs> Take care. Take care.